Hi there. Okay, on empires past and present. Listen to this. Pompey would not allow anyone to be his equal. Caesar would not allow anyone to be his superior. Some empires do not allow either, obviously. Certainly not superior, but not even equal. So it was a with great surprise that I read the article written by the present uh, director of the CIA, William Burns, saying that uh, the United States, he doesn't say empire obviously, but he says that uh, the dominion or the dominance of the United States, the uh, exceptional uh, standing of the United States um, in the world is no longer so. And he goes on, and it seems that he is kind of accepting the fact that we are moving towards a multipolar world, if not already there. And this seems surprising because, um, you know, part of, some would say, that part of what is going on in the world at the moment, all these wars and everything, are uh, in part... Um, <coughs> trying to maintain the United States hegemony, uh, the unipolar world, the United States being the one superpower. So it begs the question then if the CIA director is saying we are no longer so, what, what does this mean? In which direction is the United States going to go? Uh, now, what happened to to the United States then? It was the one dominant power, the unipolar, yeah? Certainly, um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So what happened? Well, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, since the United States was the only superpower standing then, and it's only about 30 years ago, but certainly in the last 20 years, what happened that changed the balance of power so much in the world? <coughs> yes, of course, to the victors go the spoils, yeah? But there is a problem, and that is that some countries, uh, like some individuals, it seems to me, don't know how to manage victory. I think this is what happened. You know, I think it was um, the late Pope Ven Benedict the Sixteenth who said something along the lines of, "When you are, when you are at the very top." of influence, of power, when people actually are dependent on you in some sort of way, when your words and your deeds actually affect people's lives, you are at the top, yes? He says, unless you are mad, you have to be responsible. And there are two, I agree with that, and there are two ways of managing your victory, your accomplishments you being at the top, whether, whether as a country or as an empire or as an individual or as the managing director of, of whichever corporation. Two ways. You can be magnanimous in how you manage that power and that influence. Or you can be very much aware of it and therefore go on to abuse it and, let's say, become a bully, since no one in any case is, uh, is able to, to challenge you in your power. So what I'm going with this is that what happened uh, in 9-11 uh, actually changed the world. And I think shaped how the United States would behave from then on. And 
behave themselves and treat the, the rest of the world. I'm not going to talk about politics here. I'm going to deal rather with what happens as a consequence of not managing your victory well. So you have either taken this road of magnanimity, one by means of which you're going to eventually, well, not even eventually, you're going to get the respect of the powerless, those who depend on you. Or instead, you're going to go on this other, other road of, let's say, intimidation or the abuse of power, perhaps. Uh, not to bring people up or countries up, but to keep them down. Never to make sure that never do they become your peers in any way. So how am I going to deal with with this, with this topic of either arrogance, uh, other uh, magnanimity or abuse or intimidation? So, you know me, I went back to the classics, yeah? Because as I keep saying, and I'm boring myself saying it so many times, it's all happened before. And in the case of empire, it happened many, many, many times before. So, <coughs> excuse me, we see that an empire is collapsing. In the case of Rome, I'm going to keep saying Rome, 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 but you translate Rome to whichever center of power nowadays you think fit. Um, this decline, it was not only military, but economic, cultural, and also moral. And the moral bit is important. In fact, you could argue, I think, that you, you're going to observe the, when you observe the moral decline of the people or the country, those around you, and sometimes the writers say, say they use straightforward words, they sometimes refer to it as moral perversion. You see it first because it is most obvious in the behavior of those in power. And it is this corruption of morals, of lack of restraint, when, when in fact you're so confident in your power and the fact that no one can challenge it, that you become soft and flabby, this abuse of, this absence of moral restraint of dignity that is going to obviously lead to abuse and corruption and so on. So I went to two Roman writers. They were Roman, but they were actually born in Spain. Ah, uh, you know, <laughs> but I like them both. <coughs> Luke and, and Juvenal, bo both from the first century of uh, the uh, AD of the Roman Empire. And this, this is, this, imagine, this is in the first century, okay? So it's well before the actual official fall of the Roman Empire, okay? Like two or three centuries uh, before. So they can already see the signs that something is not right. And they pinpoint both of them to the lack of dignity in the behavior of those in power, the lack of morals. They keep going to the moral thing, seeing in which direction was uh, Rome was going and where it was going to end. So I'm going to start first with some, uh, the two, yes, Lucan is one and Juvenal is the other. Juvenal is the famous satirist. You know of him because you have heard the sentence, who guards the guards? <laughs> yeah, 
it was it was him uh, okay and also um uh, bread and circus he said bread and games uh, he's a very very uh, sharp satirist and he's going to use satire to mock the powerful because when you have no power at all and you can't you are here at the bottom you have no power one of the only ways that you might have to fight back abuse from above is ridicule because that really touches them it it bothers them they begin to see that uh, they are not as powerful perhaps as they thought they were because once you start mocking power that means that you are no longer afraid okay so let's first of all look and let me I think you like this because we don't write like this anymore <laughs> uh, he says you know you can be tender you can be tender without being soft and you can be manly without being strident about Rome Rome turned the imperial sword against her own breast. What made our forefathers embark on such an orgy of self-destruction? So he's already wondering, his forefathers already. No one of Rome's uh, proud antagonists succeeded in wounding her, wounding her as deeply as she wounded herself. Only when brothers fall out is the sword driven home. Even a powerful empire spread across the world does not provide sometimes enough elbow room, it seems, for the handful that run it. They want more and more. Wonderful. It is best to take stock of your resources at your command and admit sometimes their inadequacy. Resting on their well-earned laurels Rome made no attempt to win fresh ones. It was as when it was like when a an oak towering above a lush meadow ceases to derive any support from the roots, but relies merely on its bulk to keep it upright. Passo glories, I think he's talking about. And so eventually Rome will leave nothing to boast about but its name. Uh, these are harsh critiques. Huh? For the ones, the minions, the, uh, the ones coming up sort of um, licking the boots of the powerful because they want to be on their good side he says Pompey used one uh, Pom Pompey starts again Pompey used once to lick off the blood of uh, Sulla's sword blades and has never since lost the craving for it but a diet of human blood turns a man into a savage starve the mob and it will grow restless and then the matrons of Rome put on mourning dresses and crowded into the temple mourning mm -hmm. Some wept and bathed the images in the temple with their tears. Some flung themselves on the marble floors. Others distractedly pulled out their hair, scattering on the sacred threshold. And then they 
shrieked at the gods instead of praying to them. It was the gods' fault, not theirs. And so the powerful engaging is starvation on purpose what a refinement of cruelty to deny a clean death to those who are already dying. And we could witness the collapse of Rome, Rome which had been under heaven's starry arch, and yet they sit unperturbed with folded hands, while the earth shudder beneath the shock of univer universal catastrophe. And so I shall embrace for the last time the cold corpse of Rome, whose other name was Freedom, and I'll follow her to the graveside. For the mask has been torn from the face of evil and the shameful death that honor has died. Its character, Rome's, proved to be unstable in that age of ambition, luxury and destructive wealth destructive wealth. It was swept away by the torrent of corruption, physical and moral. And it would be beneath God's dignity to spare a thought for the lives of rascals like them. They're talking to the powerful of Rome. Just a few ones from Juvenal, the satirist. I have to say it with a smile. <laughs> he says, since the days of the flood, when Deucalion anchored his ship on a mountain peak, has there ever been such so rich a crop of vices? When has the purse yawned wider? And he starts talking about the corruption and the games and the perversions and what the rich do. He has a thing against the rich, <laughs> juvenile. Gambling, for example, it was one of them at the beginning. It is not, is it not plain lunacy to lose 10,000 on a turn of a dice, yet a sh yet grudge a shirt to your shivering slave. Which of your grandfathers would have built himself so many country houses or dine of seven course dine of seven courses but alone? And now the Roman citizens are reduced to scrambling for a little basket of scraps on their patron's doorstep. To those in power, to the senators and to the upstarts in politics, and senators selling their vote so that they may remain in power, he says, what is in a senator's purple stripe if the truly noble people are reduced to herding sheep when up country while you have more have uh, more stacked away while you have more stacked away in the bank than any imperial favorite oh pernicious cash it is wealth, not God, that compels your deepest reverence. He says, their conscience are cold with crime. 
their inner sweat at the thoughts of their secret guilt. Ponder these things in your mind before the trumpet sounds. Things have reached a pretty pass. Sooner or later, your chiffon gowns will lead you to worse things still. Corruption does not come all at once, but slowly, by degrees. Moral concupiscence and degeneracy and decadence and corruption. <clears throat> oh yes, you will see the startups eager to join them. Busy with their, he's talking about men here. Busy with eyebrow pencils and rouge and mascara. And their eyelids a flutter. Others sipping wine from a big glass phallus. His long luxuriant, their, their long luxuriant curls caught in a golden hairnet. He will be wearing fancy checks with a sky blue motif. And he and his slave will be using women's oaths. Now let me explain that. Women swore by Juno and though <coughs> Juvenal is, is harping so, uh, solely here on sexual implications about the what was going on, the whole of the long passage, and it's very long and I can't read it to you, uh, gives a fairly precise description of the rituals involved in the worship of the Asia, uh, Asiatic great mother goddess Ma or Sibeli or Pachamama <laughs> nowadays. The Thracian goddess Cotis or Cotito was worshipped in Athens as early as the 5th century BC and her cult was orgiastic and included many effeminate elements. And uh, um, Juvenal talks about this on how their behaviour in this orgies. But he's not the only one. The historian Josephus, first century too, who was Jewish and uh, Roman Jewish, he actually uh, in the uh, he wrote a book, the uh, the Jewish Wars, and he actually talks too about writes as well about similar practices um, in Jerusalem, and he talks about transvestism, elaborate mo makeup, what he terms degenerate eroticism, and he describes them as the characteristics of certain Galileans in Jerusalem. And the reverence or worship or whatever uh, to the mystical marriage of Gracchus. All of them talk about the phallic-shaped drinking vessels. You will find that symbol or that shape in drinking glasses, in cakes, in lamps. And they were very popular in Rome at the time. Actually, uh, there is a book written in 1941 by G. R. Scott and it's called The Phallic Worship. Anyway, Juvenal continues actually mocking their behavior. Here is another one clutching a mirror 
just like the fag of an emperor. Look, another one peeking at himself to see how his armor, how his armor looked before riding into battle. Going to wars with mirrors forming part of your kit? <laughs> oh yes, polish off a rival, but keep your complexion fresh. On the field of battle and giving yourselves a face mask? Oh, that argues true courage. Not even Cleopatra herself aboard that unlucky flagship behaved in such a fashion. Here you will find no restraint of speech, no decent table manners. Here are the goddesses, minions, here shrill, affected voices are quite in order in these gatherings. And then the politicians who are always praising honesty, but honest men freeze. The wealth springs from crime. Goodness, that was what Proudhon, the anarchist in the 1830s, said. You remember he said, all property is theft. It will then create revolutions and socialism, communism. But uh, Juvenal said, all wealth springs from crime. You can say not necessarily. I mean, if you work hard and you, you know, well, <laughs> They would say perhaps that, yes, you work hard and you can earn a living and, and, uh, and live well, but extreme wealth, you, well, at least you have never, you, you've never earned it <laughs> with your hands, with work, as it were, perhaps with the speculation, and is that good or bad? Well, it's for you to judge. Uh, these people, he says, they disregard everything. They're people without conscience. Oh, but you ridicule them when you laugh at them. You can use satire, he says. Satire is a naked sword on them. They go red with rage. Their conscience consciences are cold with all the crimes they have committed. They're all really puffed up criminals. Their inner sweat at the thought of their little secrets. My <laughs> gosh, he's, uh, <laughs> he's a way of saying things, I must say. So the hypocrisy of politicians, uh, nothing new. You have to play the game, first of all. Okay, so he's so tired of them. He's so tired of politicians who come to promise and tell you what they're going to do and so on. He says, I want to escape to the north. I want to escape northward to the end of the world, to Lapland, to the frozen polar. <laughs> Ice cup. That is where I want to escape when I hear all these high flung moral discourses from the clique in Rome who affect, when they talk to the people, they affect the, the ancestral peasant values as a front for their lechery. How lucky we are in having you, politician, look after my morals. And he who is out there on your face telling you what is good for you turns round and says, and he goes back to the sexual degeneracy, you know, people in islands and things, okay? After he has given you a lesson on morals, he turns round and says to his companion, Oh, do tell me, darling, where do you buy that divine perfume I can smell on your beastly neck? 
come, come, don't be ashamed to tell me the name of the shop. <laughs> He's mocking them. Uh, now, uh, this one, the next one, I don't know whether you had seen um, a, a video where um, Tucker Carlson is speaking to an audience in Canada and he's really going, uh, you know, for the, well, not the government, especially uh, Trudeau, the Prime Minister. And he's saying how the fury that he, he lashed against the um, people who go to church, especially during the pandemic. And, uh, and he says, uh, you know, actually, you know, these people are not, why did you do that, Trudeau? I mean, these people are not terrorists. They haven't blown up any pipes anywhere. They have why why did you go so hard against them uh, he says and the 90 churches that were burnt and you were on the side of those who burned them and he says look don't give me any explanations this is Tucker Carlson don't give me any explanation the fact that you are in favor on the side of those who burned the churches is enough you are on the wrong side so that was Tucker Carlson, just, I don't know, a week ago, something like that. Today is the 2nd of February, 2024. But I thought of, of him when uh, I, I see here Juvenal saying, Do you remember that actor, what's his name? He was called the Danube Basin. Everyone knows why, during his married life, he showered gifts on his wife, yet left, when he died, left both house and property, his fortune, to a favoured freedman. Girls can do well for themselves if they don't mind sleeping third in the marriage bed, says Juvenile. Their mothers will tell them, just marry him and keep silent. You can get lots of diamond earrings for that. So, you hypocrite telling me about the right thing to do. You are too willing to censor the dove, and yet so willing to absolve the perverted raven. This is what brought to mind um, uh, Tucker Carlson and the, and the 90 churches and why especially to the Christian people who went to church. You are too willing to censor the dove, yet also willing to absolve the perverted raven. And this is coming from those who lecture us on morals while dressed in transparent chiffon. <laughs> anyway, so he's almost despairing, okay? And uh, corruption, okay, he says, Oh, well, farewell, Rome. I leave you to your sanitary engineers and municipal architects, to men who by swearing that black is white, land all your juicy contracts. Just like that. New temples, swamp drainages, Harvard work, Harvard works, river clearings, the lot. Then they pocket the cash and fraudulently file for bankruptcy. There are such men who fortune, by way of a joke, will sometimes raise them from the moral gutter in which they are to make them top people. So how can I continue living in Rome? 
I never learned how to lie. I refused to become an accomplished in theft, which means that no governor, governor will ever employ me. But, you know, not all gold is worth the price that you pay. The worries, the secrets, the insomnia. For what? Too transient a prize. And so justice has withdrawn to heaven and chastity went with her. Two sisters together beating a common retreat. And those with their powered faces, powdered faces, with the rouge and all the makeup, they make you wonder what is underneath. Is it a face or a boil? <laughs> They've forgotten what blushing means. Shame has been driven out of Rome. But you will find soon enough that such a life can get just as boring as any other. In fact, it is restraint. It is restraint that in fact gives an edge to all your pleasures. It's not abandonment to them. It is actually the restraint itself that gives the edge. Just one more. I hope you're still with me. Let me tell you just just so what do we do? What can we do? Um, okay, so we can use we have no power, we can use satire in order to demonstrate to them that we have no fear. That's the first step. Let me tell you, but against this uh, corruption of power, let me tell you about a man called Curius Dentatus. Dentatus was the name that uh, the people gave him because of dente, teeth. It was, uh, people said that he was born with teeth already, so they call him Dentatus. He was a powerful person, he was a warrior, and he was also consul. And uh, very famous, he defeated in battle just about everyone. The Sabines, or Sabines, I don't know how to pronounce this. <coughs> I'll, tell to, I'll, I'll tend to pronounce it with the Latin thing. So the Sabines, during his first, uh, he defeated them during his first consulship in the year 290 BC. He also defeated Paris during his second consulship in 275, and he defeated just about everybody else during his third. Okay, but nevertheless, his honesty and simplicity were proverbial, and though powerful, he can be a lesson to the powerless, the demos, democracy, ordinary people now in our days with nothing but a simple, what do we have besides mockery and ridicule? We have our, <laughs> we have a vote every four years or five or seven, whatever country you're in. Okay, so we have this tiny little vote <laughs> and I don't know to what extent we can depend on that anyway, but uh, we don't have very much really. So anyway, then tattoos. After the conquest of the Sabines during his first consulship, he took no more land than any other common soldier. You know, um, they would take, you know, the vantage. So, uh, his only booty from the defeat of, of Pyrrhus in the second consulship was just, this is what he took, a wooden sacrificial bowl. That's what he took as booty. And afterwards he retired to his farm. And one 
day, an embassy came, a bunch of diplomats there, were sent to him uh, to persuade him to come to their side in some battle or other. Anyway, so, so they found him sitting there by the fire, roasting turnips. And they tried to, in order to persuade him to join them, uh, they tried to give him very, very expensive gifts to bring him to their cause. But he refused them. And what did he say? He said, now, you know, I prefer ruling the wealthy to possessing wealth myself. I prefer ruling the wealthy to possessing wealth myself. Thank you very much. So, when they all come bearing gifts at election time, do what he said, he told the people to do. Tell them all to fly. They are already airborne. This is the end of my talk today to you. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Oh, you know, hey, for those of you who are still with me, I am. Um, I was questioning what is going on in my channel again, one more time, because I have like twenty four thousand, twenty five thousand subscribers, and nevertheless, of late. I'm only, my videos are only watched by about 50 people and I thought this is very strange so what am I doing wrong? Well the obvious answer is well they're not you know the videos are not good and uh, people don't want to watch them but I don't well that's that's an explanation but I, I, I don't think it's enough Perhaps everybody does what I do, that perhaps when I like a video I subscribe and then I forget about it because I don't receive the notifications or whatever. So that could be another thing. I don't know what else to think that is happening because it's uh, actually rather sudden that everything went down, down, down in the, in the, in the number of views. Let me, let me, uh, if you have any other explanation, let me know. <laughs> any, any ideas, any suggestions, anything in the comments. Okay, bye-bye.